All right, so this is the lecture for uh, Monday, the 9th of uh, November. If I remember, we left off, we were talking about Jupiter and uh, going through the Galilean moons of Jupiter, the four big moons of Jupiter. You can see them then just with a small telescope or maybe even binoculars. These are the moons Galileo saw going around Jupiter then, even with his uh, small little telescope and realizing that there are other centers of motion in the solar system. And the idea then that the Earth could actually go around the sun and not leave its moon behind if Jupiter um, was doing the same. And we've already talked then, you know, there, there are the four moons, uh, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. We've already talked about Io and Europa. We have left then uh, the two outermost of the moons then, Ganymede and Callisto, and we can kind of do them together. And you can tell that then just by, just by their appearance here. So looking at them, Ganymede, Callisto then, they've basically got crusts, but unlike the terrestrial planets, remember we're far from the sun, things are a lot cooler, a lot colder. Uh, these surfaces then are actually sort of crusts of, of ice. And so they've got these icy, icy crusts. Possibly there's some maybe evidence for some sort of liquid water uh, closer to the cores of these two moons. I'll talk about that in the, in a second. But just looking at them though, and thinking about you know the ages of their surfaces, you can compare them to what we saw with Europa and what we saw with Io and look then at the number of craters that you see. And looking at Io then, hardly any old no craters. Uh, looking at Europa, just a handful of craters. Um, looking then at Ganymede and Callisto, yeah, there are a lot of craters. And what does that tell you then about the age of the surface? And hopefully you're looking at that and going, yeah, these are much, much older surfaces than the two inner moons, Io and Europa. And Gan or, sorry, Callisto here then, this is actually the most cratered surface in the solar system. It's actually... Um, sort of at the maximum crater density. Any new craters that form on Callisto then um, are, are pretty much going to erase a crater that's uh, already there. You can't fit any more craters then um, onto this surface. So so these are these are very, very old surfaces then. These moons have not seen a lot of geolo geological activity uh, for a very, 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 very um, long time. And looking at their sizes then, these are, these are large moons then. Um, gosh, what do we say about it? Uh, comparable in size to Mercury about one and a half times bigger than our own moon. And if you look at the densities, though, you get about 1.9 grams per cubic centimeter for Ganymede, 1.8 cubic centimeters uh, for Callisto. And that's telling you, you know, sort of their composition. Remember, typical sort of silicate rocks, you're kicking around densities of what, three and a half grams per cubic centimeter. Water's about one gram per cubic centimeter. These moons actually more towards the water end of things. And so uh, a good proportion then of water with some sort of rocky type silicate materials then mixed in. And looking at the surfaces, though, these are clearly ice surfaces. And this idea that, yes, even these moons then um, have differentiated. And that's not so hard, though, if you think about an object then that's made of a, a mixture of rock and ice, um, you know, to get it to differentiate, all you need to do is melt the ice. And so you don't need that high a temperature then to, to get something like this then um, to differentiate. All right, and so, so these are very, very old surfaces. Um, and if you look, though, um, closely at Ganymede, I don't know if you can see this on the, on the screen. Hopefully, you've downloaded the slides and are looking at them as you're watching this. But if you do look on Ganymede, though, you do see sort of these, these sort of patterns in of these, um, what do we want to say, sort of sort of uh, ridges in or some sort of fault-like terrain where maybe at some point in the past, a long time ago, then there, there was geological activity. But a lot of these faults and cracks then, you know, have a lot of craters then on top of them which is telling you then that they formed a long time ago. And that might make sense then, because Ganymede then, remember that's part of the orbital resonances. If you look then at Io, Europa, and Ganymede, they're all involved in that four, two, one orbital resonance. And so you might expect some tidal heating then for, from Ganymede. Callisto though, uh, nah, it's not really part of that resonance. It's further away. And Callisto then maybe not so much of a, a, an internal heat source then. Um, all right. Oh gosh, what else? You can maybe start even thinking about whether or not you're looking at an old crater or, or a new crater and imagining um, this is more the case, you know, being, being from up north and where you'd have the snow and it would snow and it would never get warm enough to melt the snow for a really long time over the winter. And so you'd have this snow and that first day after the snow fell, it'd be all real pretty and stuff. But over time, you know, the snow just getting dirtier and dirtier is, is grime and dirt. And so, you know, just building up the, uh, on top of the snow, then making it, making it look, you know, less, less pretty, less white. 
And the same almost sort of thing happening then with the surfaces of these moons. You get this nice ice crust that forms, and it's probably going to be nice and bright and shiny. But over time, just from you know, the, the impacts then of little bits of asteroids and debris and dust and stuff then from space onto these surfaces, then they're going to get dirtier and dirtier and dirtier, darker and darker and darker, covering up that pristine layer of ice that's, that's on the crust until you get an impact. You know, some asteroid then later on, some little piece of debris later on hits this surface then, and you know, boom! It hits it. It's it's basically going to make a crater, and that, that crater then is going to expose material that that you know is further down that that hasn't been made dirty by all the stuff falling on it over time. You see these little bright craters here. That's sort of the idea behind what's behind them. You're seeing them uh, the crust a little bit deeper, hasn't been sort of dirtied over time. You're seeing more recent craters then, uh, uncovering then some of this this uh, this crust material that, that, that hasn't had time to get dirty yet. And so you can even start talking then about the ages of the craters, uh, just based on whether, you know, how dark they are. If they're dark, it's an old crater. It's basically gotten dirty with time. If it's light, it's a relatively new crater. You're seeing pristine ice that's just been uncovered um, in the impact. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. It's interesting to look at the moons then, and this is this is just a, a table then. It's got stuff like it's the moon's diameter, the moon's mass, uh, the, the semi-major axis of the moon, the orbital period of the moon, the inclination of the orbit then in degrees, the eccentricity of the orbit, and Looking at these four Galilean moons, then, one thing you notice is they all go around Jupiter in the same direction. If you're looking from above, they're going around counterclockwise. You look at Jupiter from above, it's rotating counterclockwise, just like most of the things in our solar system. Um, and you look then at the inclination, you know, how tilted is the plane of these moons? And the biggest one is tilted by less than half a degree. And, and so they're going around then, Jupiter, all in the same plane all in the same direction, you know, where have we seen that before? And I'm hoping you're thinking about our solar system. Yeah, we talked about that with our solar system. The idea is that, you know, of the, the planets forming around the sun. Well, the sun was in the process of forming in the solar nebula. And going back to the idea of Jupiter and the same sort of process, because the core of the forming Jupiter, more than 15 Earth masses, that's enough gravity to start pulling gas from the solar nebula then onto the forming Jupiter. The conservation of angular momentum then is going to make that gas spin into a disk shape. And if we can get a creation process and little particles sticking together in that disk, um, we can start maybe making moons that are going to form in a disk then um, orbiting Jupiter. And like our solar system, then, what sort of properties are you going to expect from a process like that? And you say, well, I'll expect everybody in the same plane because it's a disk. I'll expect everybody sort of moving in the same direction because it's a spinning disk. But I'll also ex sort of expect maybe even composition differences in terms of you know, how far away we are from Jupiter. What sort of a moon, what sort of material am I, am I going to get? depending on how far from Jupiter I am. Like we see with the planets in the solar system, up close to the sun, the terrestrial planets and uh, balls of rock and, and metals because it was warm near the forming sun. And it's not till you get out to the, you know, beyond the orbit of Mars that the temperatures were cold enough then for ices to also be forming. And you could start building planets, not only with rock and metals, but also with ices. Well, what about the same thing? What about the same thing happening here with Jupiter? And Jupiter in this formation process, it's going to be warm. You've got Jupiter pulling all this gas onto each other. That contraction then is going to release heat. Probably, you know, being a really massive planet, Jupiter is going to release a lot of heat. And thinking about moons that form up close to Jupiter, and well, gosh, maybe you're not going to have so much ices up close to Jupiter. You're going to have more sort of rocks and metals. And the further away you get from Jupiter, the colder it's going to be. So you'll not only not only have rocks and metals, but the further away you get, you'll also tend to find more and more ices. And do we see that then in the composition then of Jupiter's moons? Well, I don't know. So, well, density. Density is a way of talking about composition. The more metals it has, the higher the density. You know, the more rocks it has, the higher the density. The more ices it has, the lower the density. And the density then, just looking at uh, Io, 3.5 grams per cubic centimeter. Europa, 3. Uh, uh, Ganymede then, 1.9. Uh, Callisto, 1.8. So we're going 3.5, 3, 1.9, 1.8. Oh, wait, the further away we're getting from Jupiter, the less dense these moons are becoming. Well, the less density they have, the higher the proportion of ice there is that makes them up, makes makes them up in relative to the, the rocks and metals. So we're seeing the same sort of thing here that we saw in our solar system, up close to the forming Jupiter, not a lot of ices, mostly rocks, 
bits of metals and stuff like that. So you'll have higher density and getting further and further away from Jupiter, lower and lower densities. And that's the idea behind the formation then of the Galilean moons, that they're regular moons of Jupiter then. They formed in the process of the formation of Jupiter with a disk that formed around Jupiter as that 15 Earth mass, you know, protoplanetary protoplanetary core started pulling gas then in from the solar nebula onto it. Hopefully that makes sense. It's almost like a mini solar system with Jupiter then in these regular moons. And, you know, you go, yeah, well, Jupiter's got a lot of moons, 79 moons. Uh, most of them, remember, are irregular. They're small little captured asteroids. And you can tell then because their orbits, some of them are orbiting in the wrong direction. Those would be on retrograde orbits. Some of the orbits then are tilted at wacky angles with respect to the plane of Jupiter's rotation. And so you can, you can identify these just by their orbits often um, compared to the regular moon to Jupiter. All right. One last thing to talk about with Jupiter before we move on. And um, gosh, back in 1930, uh, or in the 1930s, we're not exactly sure, some, somewhere back then, um, almost about 90 years ago, um, a comet ended up passing a little bit too close to Jupiter. And it, it ended up being gravitationally captured by Jupiter, basically going from an orbit around the sun. We'll talk more about comets later, but an orbit around the sun then. Um, it got captured by Jupiter's gravity, and it ended up then orbiting um, Jupiter in a highly, highly eccentric orbit that brought it in near close to Jupiter. And it was inside the Roche limit of Jupiter. And remember the thing about the Roche limit, if you have an object then that's just sort of, you know, held together kind of almost by its own sort of gravity, however weak it may be, inside the Roche limit then there are these tidal forces that have a tendency to shred those objects that opt, you know, act in opposite direction, pulling it towards Jupiter on one side, pushing it away from Jupiter on the other side. And um, it turns out then at one point then we believe, gosh, um, uh, somewhere, gosh, what do we want to say? Well, we're not entirely sure, but we think it was somewhere around the 8th of July, 1992, um, that this comet then actually broke up into little pieces as it was orbiting Jupiter. And it also turns out that orbit its orbit that it was was also unstable. And so this comet then inside the Roche lobe of Jupiter it got broken up into, into little bits then and on an orbit then that was essentially unstable. And it was discovered then in 1993 um, uh, by uh, Carolyn and Jean Shoemaker and David Levy. So the, the comet then is known as Shoemaker Levy 9. So it was the ninth comet the, uh, that that team um, had discovered. And but, but gosh, what do we want to say about that then? I mean, they found it then actually after it had been broken up. So it broke up in July of 92. They discovered it in March of 1993, shortly after that. Um, it, had, it had been broken up. But, you know, you just need to watch this move and figure out its orbit. And it was pretty, pretty clear then that sometime in July, uh, that, that comet then was actually going to end up striking uh, Jupiter. And that's exactly what happened. This was a comet then that traveled, that basically got too close to Jupiter, got captured by Jupiter's gravity, ended up orbiting Jupiter in an unstable orbit, getting close to Jupiter then. The tidal forces shredded it. And then those little, in, those little bits then ended up impacting then. Um, on Jupiter. And this is a picture then in the in the uh, infrared then taken of the comet then by, by the Hubble Space Telescope. This was May 17th, 1994. And the, uh, basically it's a train then of 21 fragments of this comet. It's the tidal forces then just pushed it and pulled it then and just sort of shredded it um, into a long line like this then. It's about 1.1 uh, million kilometers then from end to end, or about 100, 710,000 miles in, um, from one end to the other. Um, and it's about three times the Earth-Moon uh, Earth distance then, just for, for reference. Um, and gosh, what do we want to say? Oh, uh, gosh. Yeah, so this was taken about 660 million kilometers uh, from Earth, about 410 million uh, miles away. Um, and they're on their way then um, to, to crashing into Jupiter. So this was taken in May, and in July then, um, they ended up crashing into Jupiter. Um, it was a thing, um, at least for, especially for astronomers and uh, pretty much every telescope on Earth um, or around Earth uh, was watching this event. And here is, here is a series of images taken from Hubble Space Telescope in different bands or different colors of light then um, watching the impact. And this is July 16th, 1994. The sort of downside of this, though, is if you look at the geometry of the collision. So this is the direction towards Earth. Here's the surface of Jupiter. And the actual 
collisions then took place, you know, here is basically anything below this line then. This is the direction towards Earth. Anything below this line is below the horizon on Jupiter then. So as far as we were concerned looking at them, they took place on the backside of Jupiter. But, you know, as Jupiter's rotation, this is sort of the view from above. Here's Jupiter rotating then counterclockwise. Jupiter's rotation, though, carried um, the result of the impact, like the fireball then that was the result of the impact then, um, into our view shortly, you know, basically a couple minutes later then into our view. And what we ended up seeing then was basically, you know, here's the impact. We've got sort of a, a meteor trail then. It gets really, really hot. Bits of the bits of that chunk that's about to impact Jupiter then start, start blowing off. You end up with this wake hits and it's tough to talk about the surface of Jupiter, remember, because it doesn't really have one, but basically plows into the atmosphere. Then um, you get a fireball and that fireball then expands. And as it expands, then it cools and you end up then with this big expanding fireball as it cools then material condenses out of the fireball then and ends up then uh, this cooling plume then ends up then falling onto the surface of Jupiter and leaving behind then this warm ring of material um, that was heated in this process then, and, and condensed. And that's exactly what you see then. Um, gosh, what do we have to say about this? Uh, here's sort of the, the view then from Space Telescope that where you see the sort of exploding fireball, it being carried into view. What was nice, uh, just jumping back though, is Galileo, the, the space probe, the Jupiter probe was actually also in orbit around Jupiter uh, at this time. And if you look at Galileo's position though, it actually could see um, the, the actual impact scent of the shoemaker levy chunks. And so that's the view from uh, Hubble. Here's a series of images then from, uh, from Galileo, though, actually showing the impact then. Um, uh, this is the W fireball then, the impact then of these comet fragments on Jupiter. And, and they were given names, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, then just basically in the order they hit Jupiter. And this then is the W fireball. This is a visible light uh, picture then taken. And you can see then the, these impacts uh, sort of in the atmosphere of Jupiter then, where the comet hit, you got the fireball right, you know, expanding and cooling, and the debris from the fireball cooling them and leaving behind these rings. And so this is uh, this is the G fragment sort of here, and you can see the, the ring, uh, this huge scar left behind then in the atmosphere of Jupiter. And this one, the, the sort of outer ring here then, is about 12,000 kilometers, uh, 12,000 kilometers uh, across then. And you go, wow. I mean, just this it was just an impressive thing to see. This is taken in the infrared uh, with uh, with the University of Hawaii then uh, telescope then uh, on Mauna Kea, and you can see then you know these hot spots on the in the atmosphere. I keep, I keep wanting to say surface of Jupiter then um, that were created by these impacts, and it was it was particularly interesting because it was a chance to look a little bit at Jupiter's atmosphere. This idea then that that the, these impacts then will kick some of the lower. Uh, atmospheric material up a little bit, maybe for some some hope, some chance then um, of actually observing it. And and you can see though just the heat that was generated then um, in these in these uh, in these collisions. So it was really really a neat 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 thing to see. Um, and gosh, I mean the question is, um, does this happen? You know, how often does this happen where Jupiter then is is hit by hit by comets or hit by hit by asteroids or, you know, hit by debris in the solar system. And we'll talk, you know, towards the end, you know, about how often the Earth is hit by comets and other debris. And so how frequent do you think that is? How often do you think Jupiter gets hit by stuff? Well, it turns out it's not that interesting. These are actually not uh, pictures of Shoemaker-Levy 9. This was a, an impact then in 2009. So this was, this was what, God, I can't even do math right now. Uh, 15 years later then, um, um, another impact on Jupiter. And then a year later, there was another impact and there was another impact in 2016. So this, this actually turns out it happens every few years, some comet or something that actually impacts Jupiter. Um, it's just, you know, up until recently, we haven't been able to observe them that well. And of course, the nice thing about Shoemaker-Levy 9 then is it was particularly spectacular. We had a fairly large comet fragmenting and, and creating then all of these impacts on Jupiter. So so quite something to see. Um, yeah. All right. If you get bored, you can come to the office hours and I can tell you about looking at this thing. I was actually uh, at an observatory at the time myself and actually got to see this with my own eyes, um, which was kind of cool. Anyways. All right. That is it for Jupiter. Uh, give me a second and I will uh, I will reset and we'll talk uh, talk a little bit then about Saturn.
All right, welcome back. Um, this is, of course, duh, Saturn. Um, and this is probably one of the most recognizable planets um, in our solar system. When you think of Saturn, then, uh, you, of course, think of the rings. If you read you know, Galileo's you know, initial observations of Saturn, he didn't realize they were rings. He didn't recognize them as rings. He talked about Saturn as having ears. Um, but, but, of course, you know, that, that's sort of what it's famous for. Even though all four of the Jovian planets have ring systems, you can see these rings, um, again, even with a good set of binoculars, certainly with the telescopes and on top of Rankin. Um, they're, they're just very, very visually striking. And, you know, what do I want to say? Then? They're easy, easy to see. And so most of, but what, most of what we know about Saturn then, of course, has come from spacecraft. And there was the boy, there were the Voyagers, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 in the 80s, I think it was 80, 81, went past Saturn. And more recently then the Cassini uh, spacecraft with the Huygens probe uh, went past Saturn. And I think it got there about 2004. And it ended up then, uh, well, it ended up, we crashed it into Saturn then in about, in, yeah, in 2017 then we crashed it into Saturn. And for the same reason, when our probes are done with Jupiter, we crash them into Jupiter. We, we want it to burn up then in Saturn's atmosphere rather than crashing on one of the moons and leaving behind debris and and, you know, what if we didn't sterilize it? And, you know, uh, who knows what could happen then? So so we'd rather just plow the things right into the atmosphere of Saturn or Jupiter then and, and not worry about them. All right. So the sort of statistics on Saturn and the details, it's a mass then is about 95 times the mass of the Earth. So just ballpark looking at it, then it's about three times less massive than Jupiter. Remember, Jupiter, 318 times the mass of the Earth, Saturn, 95 times the mass of the Earth. So, so even the next largest of the Jovian planets then is still only just less than a third um, the mass of, of Jupiter then. Its radius, about nine and a half Earth's radii. Uh, its rotation period, 10.5 hours. Again, much like Jupiter, it's spinning like crazy. Remember, Jupiter, as massive it is, as it is, and is going around, you know, one, in less than 10 hours for it to rotate once. Saturn then is just a little over 10 hours, so it's rotating like crazy. Um, it's time to go around the sun is about 30 years or so. It's about nine and a half times the distance from the sun that we are. Call it 10 astronomical unit units. It's got about 60 moons, and again, a mixture of probably regular moons, but by far more most of the moons are irregular, uh, gravitationally um, captured objects. And looking at Saturn then, um, it, it's rotating very, very fast, but it also then has a much lower density um, than Jupiter does. And there's a, there are a couple things going on with that, but one of the things with Jupiter, why, why it tends to have a large density, larger than Saturn, it's not that their compositions are significantly different. It's not like Jupiter then has more rock than Saturn does. One of the things going on with Jupiter, though, is just the tremendous pressure inside Jupiter is squeezing things together. So I have more and more mass, more and more material packed in a smaller and smaller volume. Well, wait, that's the density. That's the, the definition of density. The more density is a measure then of how much mass I have inside some volume. How many grams do I have in every cubic centimeter um, of Jupiter? And we talk about it, you know, on average for these planets. And what's going on with Jupiter then is its core. There's so much pressure on its core. It's got so much mass squeezed into such a small space um, that its density then, because of this compression, um, is sort of artificially high. And that actually goes on with all the planets. The Earth then, its density is actually a little bit higher than it would be given its true composition. But you, you can mathematically compensate for that. You have some idea then of how rocks and stuff deform under pressure. Certainly less true for Jupiter's interior because those are extreme conditions. But it, it's sort of the same thing going on. So, so Saturn then, um, its core is less compressed than Jupiter's core because its mass is less than Jupiter's mass. It's got far less compression in its core. So its overall density is less than water. And there's the old joke then, if you had a bathtub big enough because its density is less than water, a Saturn would float in it. And then the, the end of the joke then is, but it would leave a ring. Oh, um, astronomy humor, never, never good. Um, and looking at it though, it's got sort of similar colors to Jupiter, but but they're different. They're, they're much more subdued. I mean, Jupiter's bands and zones really jump out at you. You sort of see what looks like sort of band zone structure and structures on Saturn, but they're a little fuzzier. They're a little more subdued then. And the idea behind that then is because they're happening deeper 
in the atmosphere then of Saturn. And so you can talk about Jupiter then, and you go, okay, I've got some nice bright white ammonia clouds here up near the atmosphere, um, up near the top of the atmosphere where it's cooler. Those, those same clouds, those ammonia clouds, clouds then are forming on Saturn, but they're forming deeper in Saturn. And that's because at that temperature then, Saturn being cooler, you reach that temperature pressure combination that creates those clouds even lower than in Saturn's atmosphere. And there's this sort of methane haze above it that, that's making it look more muted. And it's, it's almost sort of like, you know, it's looking through a haze or kind of like a fog. And notice I'm talking about methane here. We'll get back to methane then, certainly when we also talk about Uranus and Neptune. And out here far from the sun then, um, methane, we, we, we find ourselves talking about methane as a surprising, uh, surprising amount. We'll get back to that. I'm sort of, sort of mumbling here though, just sort of telegraphing that, that methane is going to be a, a, a more important constituent then, the further away from the sun, the, the sun we end up getting then. And as you'd expect then, Saturn does have a magnetic field, but it's weaker than the, the magnetic field of Jupiter. Remember, if you go back and, oh, I should have had the wits to put the slide in here, but if you go back and think about the lecture then that we had on Friday, where I showed sort of the interiors of the different Jovian planets, remember Saturn and Jupiter going down in Saturn then, you've got sort of the, this, this layer of liquid hydrogen, and it's much, how do we want to say it, it's much, much, it's a much bigger proportion of Saturn's interior than it is in Jupiter, and you got to go fairly down deep in Saturn to run into the liquid metallic hydrogen, as opposed to Jupiter. And we're just speaking sort of proportional to the actual size of Jupiter, relative to the size of Jupiter. You don't need to go very far in before you start running into the liquid metallic hydrogen. But that, again, is just because Jupiter's mass is so much bigger. You've got all that more pressure squeezing down on Jupiter, squishing the, the hydrogen closer and closer together to the point where you get liquid hydrogen, squeeze even more, you get liquid metallic hydrogen. On Saturn, less mass, it doesn't have the pressures and its interior to do this as easily as Jupiter can, to squeeze the hydrogen into the liquid metallic phase. And so Saturn then, looking at its interior, yes, it has a liquid, sort of liquid metallic region in the interior, but it's smaller. And then thinking about what you need for the dynamo effect and the generation of a magnetic field, yes, I need liquid that's conducting electricity and fast rotation, but I've got less of it in, in Saturn then. There's less liquid metallic hydrogen in Saturn because of the less lower pressure, because there's less mass, there's lower less gravity than with Saturn. So there is a magnetic field though, but it's much, much weaker than Jupiter's then. Still though, created by the liquid metallic hydrogen. All right. One thing, gosh, maybe I should have talked about this with Jupiter as well, but it's sort of a weird thing. If you look at both Jupiter and Saturn, then they create more energy or they, they radiate, they give off more energy than they receive from the sun. And that's a strange thing to think about, though. I mean, the idea, oh gosh, they're giving off more energy than they receive from the sun. How is that possible? And the idea, you know, obviously is that they must be hotter than what you'd expect from just heat from sunlight, just heat from the sun's energy striking them, warming them up, there must be also some other heat source there. And so both Jupiter and Saturn then must also have hot interiors because you look at, you know, you get the, the sunlight then heating them up and you look at how much radiation, how much energy you get coming back from that and you, you get more than you should if it was just, if they were just being heated up by the sun. And the idea then that they both have uh, uh, very, very hot interiors. And there are a couple of sort of ideas behind that. Um, looking at them then, they both have that sort of rock metal core that was the initial protoplanet then in the formation process. And um, you would expect in those rocks and metals, some radioactive materials then that are still decaying, helping to heat that core. Another idea behind them then is that they're also still in the process of differentiating. And um, that's probably, gosh, what do I want to say about that? That's probably more than we want to get into in this class, but just this idea that you can have material condensing um, in, the, in sort of the, the liquidy hydrogen outer layers of, of the, these planets. And, and that, that material condensing and falling in, you know, it condenses, it'll be a little bit more dense. It'll fall then into the core of the planet. And as something falls, it releases gravitational potential energy. You can drop something, you hear the bang. Oh, you know, it, it's, it goes from you know, not moving. I dropped it. It's going faster and faster and faster. You're, you're converting then gravitational energy that basically into, uh, uh, into, into heat. 
in, in this case. And so also still staying warm, they haven't finished differentiating yet as well, is also possibly one of the, uh, one of the explanations for that. It, regardless, though, they're giving off more energy than they're receiving from the sun. This is telling us that they both have hot interiors, that there's still something keeping the interiors warm. Those, the, those interiors are, are still in the process end of, of cooling. Well, gosh, I guess that's true. We really can't talk about Saturn without talking about the ring system. Yay! Um, and their ice, the, unlike Jupiter, remember Jupiter's Jupiter's rings, very, very thin, very, very dark, very, very hard to see. We didn't even see them until we sent a spacecraft out to Jupiter. We didn't even know they were there. Um, as opposed to Saturn's rings, which we've known of, you know, we've known about these ever since Galileo looked at it 350 uh, years ago. Uh, and these rings then are very, very bright. They're very, very reflective. And of course, that's telling you, oh gosh, they're probably and indeed are uh, made out of ice. It's very reflective. The crazy thing is how thin they are, only five to 10 kilometers thin. And so you can imagine something 140,000 kilometers then in radius or like 280,000, almost 300,000 kilometers wide. And it's only about five to 10 kilometers thick. I mean, that's that's if you were had a sheet of paper then and you said well these are saturn's rings it would be thinner than the, they would be thinner than the sheet of paper by, by a lot um and if you look at them though each think of the think of the rings and these are all individual particles then that are, in, that are in orbit around saturn each of these little tiny bits of ice and dust that are making up Saturn's ring, each little bit is on its own individual Keplerian orbit, then following Kepler's laws, going around then Saturn. Everybody's sort of moving together, almost like cars on the expressway, except everybody's sort of almost doing the exact same speed and taking the exact same path as they're going around Saturn. Yes, the inner ones are moving faster, the outer ones are moving slower, gets Kepler's three laws, but that's sort of, sort of the basic idea. And if you look at it closely, it's the, the rings then are not sort of just uniform bands. They actually consist then of thousands of tiny ringlets. And, and so there are these density differences, these density variations then within the rings. I'll talk more about those uh, in a couple of seconds. One thing to notice then is that the rings are younger than Saturn. Um, and there are a couple of different ways of looking at, at that. Then over time, the rings do deteriorate. You sort of saw a little bit of that with Jupiter. You have collisions between the ring uh, particles themselves. And in that process, then some of them then are going to end up falling into Saturn, maybe. Um, but, but the rings then, they deteriorate over time. So they've got to be replaced with new material. Also, do you, do you expect Saturn to form with a ring? Or do you expect any of the Jovian planets to form with a ring around them? That ring then has been there from the get-go, right? And you're, well, okay, well, think about that. Saturn's rings made of ice. They're up very, very close to Saturn. Well, gosh, what am I going to expect? What, are, what do I think the conditions are going to be like near a forming Saturn? Oh, wait, we saw the same thing with Jupiter then. This idea of you get 15 Earth masses worth of stuff coming together, rocks, metals, and ice is solid stuff to build the protoplanet. And at that point, it gets warm enough, or it's warm enough, massive enough to start pulling gas from the from the forming uh, protostellar you know nebula onto it and and you're going to get then the forming saturn and this rotating disk and thinking about well even we saw this with jupiter though um the, the temperatures up near saturn are going to be fairly warm because saturn's in the process of forming and this close to saturn would you expect it be to be warm enough for ice to stay solid that's right, so where i'm hoping you go well no not really and so there's no way saturn really could have formed with this ring because the heat released in the formation process is basically, you're not going to have these icy rings survive that process. And so these have to be something that formed then after the formation then of Saturn. And so the idea, of course, is much, much similar to the idea with Jupiter then. You have collisions between the moons or you know, comets, things like that. Little tiny icy particles knocked off in this process, and they end up then orbiting around Saturn. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a couple minutes. Then. But you'll also notice that there are gaps in Saturn's ring. Rings. Like right here, this huge gap right here between these two rings, there's this huge gap here then that's referred to then as the Cassini division, named, of course, after Cassini, who was the first person who sort of said, hey, no, look, there's a gap in these rings here, a great big gap like this set. And they're different, gosh, what I say, they're different processes then that create, can create gaps and other structures then in, in these uh, rings of Saturn. 
And some of them are basically resonance effects with moons. Um, you can also have a, a situation where you have moons that come along and we talk about them as shepherd moons because they keep the ring particles in, in a certain, at a certain distance from Saturn. Um, and so it's, it's sort of a combination. Then you can also have density waves uh, going on in the rings. We'll talk then for a second then um, about all of these. All right. So hopefully, though, this is making sense. Let me just make sure I'm going to cheat and uh, check my notes. There's a lot to talk about here then. Yes. Excellent. All right. So looking at the actual rings themselves. And no, I'm not going to make you remember which ring segment is which and which division is which. And, you know, the Enki division versus the Cassini division. Um. But look at this is sort of though the structure. When you look at Saturn, then you've got two rings that really jump out at you. Then you've got the outer A ring and the inner B ring. It turns out then in here is a fainter C ring and an even fainter D ring. But typically looking at Saturn, then it's the A and B rings that you really notice with the Cassini then division between them. And the A and B rings are really jumping out at you though because they're made of dust to golf ball sized pieces of ice that are reflecting a lot of light. And so those rings then totally jump out at you. As opposed to the C ring and um, the, the D ring then, those are darker. And the C ring then contains actually bigger particles, bolder sized pieces, of particles though, but it's of a, a darker material. And it's darker then because it contains sort of more minerals and, a, and darker dust than ice compared to the A and, compared then um, to the A and A and B rings then. And so, all right. So um, you'll also notice then there's A, B, C, D, and then, oh, wait a minute then, there's also, um, where, ah, there we go. There's also the E ring and the G ring and the F ring. And so you're going, oh, wait a minute, why didn't they just go A, B, C, D, E? Why aren't these in order, like in distance from Saturn? Because if I, if I was in charge, I'd probably pick something like that that made sense. And you, you might imagine that we knew about the A, B, C, and D rings first. And then as we sent spacecraft to Jupiter, we said, oh, wait a minute, there's also then an E ring. Oh, wait, look, there's an F ring. Oh, wait, there's a G ring. And so these are all then, uh, the order is messed up because it's more in order than in which they were discovered. And as you can, as you continue in astronomy, oh, you'll find that happens a lot, where, where people come up with these systems. And then as we get new knowledge, then it turns out the systems probably could have been designed better. But no, we've already been using that. So we're just going to keep doing it. Banditudes comes to mind. All right. So what's going on here, though, is um, if you look at like the Cassini division, it turns out there's a moon here then. Um, where are we? The Mimis right here. And here's the Cassini division between the A and the B ring then. And there's Mimis. And it turns out then the Cassini division is created then by a resonance then with, uh, with Mimis then. And, oh gosh, what do we want to say about that? Um, we saw then the idea of orbital resonance in, if you remember the moons, we had Io, Europa, and Ganymede, and that was a, a four, two, one resonance. So for every time Io went around four times then, Europa went around twice, and um, Io, Europa, Ganymede then um, went around one time. Sorry, I have to remember the order that way. Um, and it's the same thing going on then with Mimis. And if it turns out if you have a little sort of ring particle then at the distance from Saturn that, that the Cassini gap occurs in, well, remember, this is all following Kepler's laws. And so the further and further out you go, the longer and longer the periods are. And there's a relationship then between the distance and the period. Maybe we've seen something like that before. And it turns out though that at this distance from Saturn, the period is twice the period of this distance from Saturn, or twice the period then a ring particle at the distance of the Cassini division is going to be in orbital resonance with Mimis. A particle here then is going to go around two times for every one time, one time then Mimis goes around. And what does that mean in terms of a particle? Every two times you go around, you're back lined up with this moon. I go around two times, I'm back lined up with this moon. I go around two times, I'm back lined up with this moon. And Mimis then has a little bit of gravity. And the net effect then is that that orbital resonance is actually, it's going to pull on those particles a little bit. And over time, it'll pull the particles out of the ring at that distance. And so some of these gaps that you see in the rings, they correspond to orbital resonances then with the different moons of Saturn. And so you can get then a, a gap or a division here then 
a division of gamp in the ring with these orbital resonances because you know every three times every two times whatever however the resonance works out you're back lined up with a moon and you get sort of a little sort of gravitational tug then um pulling you in so eventually then that that tugging makes the orbit more elliptical and eventually then that particle is pulled out of its orbit then when it's at that distance uh, when it's at that distance then um from saturn and looking at it then gosh well, they're actually an all, and, and this is just a, a generic picture. Um, it turns out there, well, I don't want to say generic, but it's there's not that much detail in here. I'll show you a couple more slides where you can actually see there are many, 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 many gaps in the rings and many divisions in the rings. And there actually are too many then uh, to explain with Saturn's moons. And so these gaps and these missing sort of ring particles at these different distances, yes, some of them are obviously due to resonances, but some others though um, really can't be explained with a resonance. And it turns out then we think those are being caused by something else. And here's an example then of what you see. You're seeing then the density of ring particles here. And you can see these gaps, tons of particles, gaps, tons of particles, gaps, tons of particles, gaps. This is way more structure than you get just from resonances then with the uh, with the moons of Saturn then. And the idea behind this is what we're seeing are density waves. And this is a this is all this is this is a tough thing to talk about. But you we'll certainly talk about it then. I know I say this all the time. We'll talk about this in astronomy too uh, when we get to spiral galaxies and why galaxies like the Milky Way have spiral arms. They're basically density waves where you get a whole bunch of stuff then almost like cars on the expressway. All the particles are sort of moving in the same direction and on their own orbits. But you end up with a situation where you get a sort of pile up then, a little of so fewer more particles sort of in this part of the this this part of the spiral arm of the galaxy. In this case, the particles happen to be stars and giant clouds of dust and gas. But you have this region of enhanced density as it's going around like this. Other stars coming up from behind then feel the sort of extra gravitational pull and they get pulled in. So you've got something moving slow, it'll get sped up a little bit as it's pulled into this, this sort of in region of enhanced density. And then as these, these stars try and pull out of it, though, the density then also, you know, the gravity from all this density, this region of higher density, greater mass, it also slows them down. So it takes them a little bit longer than to pull out. So they're sort of pulled in and, and they're slowed down as they pull out these stars as they hit these, these density waves. Super good example of this. You've seen this if you've ever been like out on the highway and you go and you're driving along. Fine. Uh, I'm going the speed limit because everybody just goes the speed limit. You're driving along then at 65 miles an hour. And all of a sudden you come up on this sort of traffic jam. Everybody's all of a sudden slowing down. Everybody's hitting their brakes. And oh gosh, there's this huge increase in density of cars on the highway. You go, ah, something's going on. There must be an accident or something like that. And you're slowed down and the cars behind you are slowing down and the cars behind you are slowing down and you're creating then on the highway, this region of enhanced density. And you work your way through it and you pop out on the other side and all of a sudden nobody's in front of you. You're going 65 miles an hour again. And you go, well, where was the wreck? Where was, where was, where was whatever was causing it? Where was the cop back there causing everybody to slow down? There was nothing. You hit a density wave. And the same thing then happens in the spiral arms of galaxies. And the same thing happens in Saturn's rings as these particles are going on, going around that you hit these regions of enhanced density. What's happened though, is instead of though having a density, here's Saturn and having a density wave sort of coming out like that, like you might expect in a galaxy, the rotation of Saturn's rings and it's taken those density waves and it's basically, they basically just wound up around Saturn. So they're just these tightly wound sort of way, you know, instead of being straight out like this, I've taken it, I've just wound it around them. And you're seeing then these regions of enhanced density, they're basically density waves. And that's sort of the idea behind it. Um, it's a weird thing to think about. All right. Never sure if that made total sense or not. If it doesn't make sense, come see me. I got office hours. Um, Right. And that's not the only thing, though, because you can also look then um, and you can also see sort of these sort of density variations sort of in through here. But you also see something like this, then, where you've got the Anki gap here. And it turns out the Anki gap, then, this isn't caused by um, a tidal interaction with a moon that's further out. This isn't caused then by density waves. This gap here then, the Anki gap isn't uh, isn't caused by density waves. If you look in that gap though, 
you actually find there's this little tiny moon that actually lives in this gap. This moon then, it's known as, as Pan. This gap then is only 325 kilometers wide. And if you look in there, there carefully though, you see Pan, sort of the the ravioli moon. Um, and, and looking at it though, Pan is this very, very small moon. It's got this weird equatorial sort of ridge on it. We think that's material that's been collected by the by Pan then. Um, on, it, on its equator then, this is just dust and other sort of icy ring particles that have just collected around the equator then um, of Pan. And so here's Pan then, it's basically orbiting around, there you go, here, here it is, here's the Anki Gap, here's Pan. It's only like 10, 15 kilometers across. It's this tiny, tiny little moon. But think about what happens with the ring particles. Everybody's orbiting together or everybody's orbiting in the same direction. And you've got then this little tiny moon Pan here. And think about though, you know, Pan is moving at a certain speed. Ring particles closer to closer to Saturn are moving faster. Ring particles slower than or further away than Saturn then are moving slower. And so you've got Pan here then, and you've got ring particles and you've got uh, that are moving faster. Here's Pan here then. They're coming up on Pan from behind, and well, wait, they're going to feel Pan's gravity then. And so they're they're actually. Oh, sorry, that's, that's, they're going to come up, pull past Pan. They're moving faster than Pan. They're going to feel Pan's gravity then, and it's going to sort of slow them down into lower orbits as they're, as they're going around. Likewise, then, here's Pan. You've got the slower moving particles here. They're going to feel a gravitational pull from Pan then, and they're going to be kicked into higher orbits. And so the net effect of Pan then is that it's sort of gravitational influence that tends to push the inner ring particles in closer to Saturn, and it tends to pull the outer ring particles then away from Saturn. And you can see this then. This is referred to then as a shepherd moon because it's basically shepherding particles out of this gap. You could even then have shepherd par or, uh, shepherd moons then um, in pan or sorry in pairs. And so here are two shepherd moons then. This is Prometheus and Pandora. And this is the F ring, the very very thin ring that we talked about. What's great here is you can see the effects then of this moon's gravity on the ring particles as they're going around. And so you have one shepherd moon then, that's the, the particles outside of its orbit, it's pushing them then to higher orbits. You've got another though shepherd moon further out and it's having the opposite effect. It's pushing the ring particles in closer to Saturn. The net effect of the two moons then is one's pushing them out, one's pushing them in. And you've got then these two moons basically shepherding the ring particles um, into this, this very, 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 very thin uh, ring. And that's what's going on then um, with the with the F ring. All right. And all right, so yes, the, here we go. This is the F ring. And here then actually are the two shepherd moons, uh, sort of, what do we want to say? Uh, shepherding those particles. If they drift too far out of the ring, um, they get pushed back in. If they drift you know, away from Saturn, then they get pushed back in. If they drift too far towards Saturn, they get pushed back out, uh, basically just keeping them uh, in orbit um, around Saturn. All right. Gosh, what else to talk about that? I guess we should talk a little bit then um, about Saturn's moons. And um, we'll just talk about a few of the moons. Remember then Saturn has more than 60 moons. We'd be here forever if we were to talk about all of them then. So maybe we can just talk about then the, the four really uh, big, interesting, major moons um, of Saturn then. And, and that would be um, Titan, you know, the four big ones then up there in the lower left, left upper left. This is Titan. It's a black and white image of Titan then. This is Saturn's largest moon. It's a little bit bigger than Mercury. And gosh, um, it's so big or so massive then that its orbit then actually has an effect on the orbits then of, of uh, Saturn's uh, other moons. And gosh, yeah, let me get over here. Oh, I've lost my cursor. Dang it. There we go. Um, all right. And you'll also notice looking at it though, doesn't really have a well-defined surface. That's actually kind of fuzzy. It turns out then Titan has an atmosphere. Um, Titan is the only moon in the solar system then with an appreciable atmosphere. We also have uh, Epidus here. And if you look at Epidus then, it's kind of weird because it's got this, this sort of dark surface here and it's sort of lighter surface here. It's a weird thing, but it turns out Epidus is moving then towards the right. And so this leading side, this forward side of Epidus, then, it's, it's basically been covered by this, this dark material then. And this might be carbon rich material that's been kicked up then by collisions with, uh, with other objects then um, in the orbit of Saturn, most notably Phoebe, which is a, a small sort of satellite of Saturn. And, and you've basically seen material that's been kicked off. Phoebe then basically splattered all over the front side of Epidus. 
Um, and gosh, what else to say about that? You can't really quite see it on here, but it also turns out it has, oh, you can almost sort of see it here with this little bulge here. Um, it has an, an equatorial ridge around it then that we think probably formed back when this moon was uh, 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 um, you know, just forming. And, but it's just interesting then that you see this, this material mostly from Phoebe then um, that's sort of on basically covering the, the forward edge, you know, forward moving edge then of, of Epidus here. Um, and gosh, I should, I should, oh gosh, there's so much to talk about here. It turns out Phoebe then is actually a, a captured moon, a captured uh, object then from, you know, far, you know, the deep regions of the solar system. When we get to talking about that, then uh, carbon is not unusual on the surfaces of those objects. And so uh, maybe it's not so weird seeing this then on uh, Epidus. All right. Hold on. It, oh, okay. It looks like I'm out of time. We'll pick up then Saturn's moons then on Wednesday. I only have a little bit to talk about, a little bit more to talk about with Saturn, and then we'll move on to uh, to Uranus and Neptune. All right. So uh, hopefully everything is going well, and um, and take care. <laughs>